Howdy there folks, we are talking about a stock that has literally 100x potential and there's very few stocks in the stock market that have that sort of potential and I want to watch the investor day. Now for me to spend, this video is going to be probably over an hour, for me to spend this much time with you guys going over a video, um, it's probably for a pretty darn good reason, okay? And the company we're talking about here today, this is a company that it doesn't matter if there's a recession, it doesn't matter if there's a depression, it doesn't matter if we have a good economy, an okay economy, a great economy, this company will continue to put up incredible revenue growth numbers, customer growth numbers. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary growth story over the, not just the next year or two, but over the next decade plus. And uh, the space they're in, it's, it's, everybody's moving to this area uh, as far as consumers go over the next, um, let's call it, you know, five to 10 years, and they're going to be a massive beneficiary in this market. And, uh, you know, before we get into all the positives and, and go over this investor presentation here and whatnot, what I actually want to do is I want, I want to talk about the negative first, because there's one massive negative for this stock, okay? And that's this. This is a money-losing company right now, and it's expected to be a money-losing company over the next couple of years, okay? Now, when it comes to that, in this market, all stocks have been thrown out that are a money losing company, right? And, and not just these sorts of stocks, every stock in the whole stock market, even if you make money, your stock's down huge. But especially if you're a money losing company, the stock market wants no piece of you right now. And these sorts of stocks are down <clears throat> 70, 80, 90%, right? And that's exactly what we see with this stock. It's down nearly 90% over the past year. Now, when you're going through one of these time periods, it's a, it's a screwed up time period, right? If you're in an incredible bull market, it pushes every single stock up regardless of what you have going on, right? 99% plus of stocks go up. It doesn't make any sense, but it'll push all stocks up if you're in some incredible bull market where, you know, the stock market just goes absolutely to the moon, right? On the downside, if you're in a crashing market, if you're in a collapsing stock market, a massive bear market, it pushes every single stock down and down huge, and money losing companies the most. And regardless, it, the, the thing is that there's going to be some companies that are not going to be around, right? And there's going to be some companies that can't grow. And then there's going to be other companies, just like what happened in the tech bubble, that continue to grow year after year after year and become undeniable beast companies and grow into companies that have tens of billions of dollars of market cap or hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap. And so for this one uh, to basically 100x, it needs to become like a basically about a $60 billion market cap over the next 10, 15 years. And I think with this one, it's definitely a possibility with it. But they're a huge money loser right now. No one wants a piece of any of these sorts of companies right now. I look at this time period as a pretty rare opportunity. And if we go back to the tech bubble days, what was the thing that differentiated uh, businesses that went under in that whole situation versus the ones that didn't, right? The ones that didn't go under were ones that were cash loaded, which this company actually has a, a lot of money on their balance sheet. And the ones that continue to put up incredible growth numbers year after year after year, even if they were losing money. And so, you know, you look at the companies that kind of made it through that mess, they went down a lot. Like, you know, you even look at Amazon, for instance, Amazon was a joke 20 years ago. You know, no one took that company serious in the tech bubble days, right? And Amazon, that stock went down over 90% peak to trough. And so that's exactly what's happened with this stock here. And um, I think it has just ridiculous upside over the coming years. And so um, I've actually bought some shares of the stock. I actually own some shares. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a risky stock, no doubt, because it's a money loser. But the upside potential here is absolutely ridiculous. And like I said, it doesn't matter what happens in the economy. This company will continue to grow numbers on an, uh, let's just call it a very impressive scale, regardless. It does not matter. And that's very rare because there's a lot of companies out there that are basically experiencing right now what's going on with a lot of companies is their revenues are not hitting even remotely close to numbers analysts had projected. And some companies' revenues are going basically negative and they're starting to lose customers in this environment. This company, it doesn't matter. They're going to continue to grow customer count and revenue at a ridiculous pace over the coming years and get closer to profitability, in my opinion, over the next couple of years, which is pretty darn impressive. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this. Like I said, if I'm going to spend this sort of time with you guys going over a company, like, um, you know, there's got to be something there and something pretty darn big. And that's definitely, um, you know, the, the potential here. And we went over the risk, okay? Now, also... If you didn't know, we uh, depending upon when this video comes out, the Become Master Stock Market flash sale might be on. That will be pinned comment down there. Um, if you're watching this video more than, let's call it uh, 36 hours or 48 hours, the sale will already be over. 
And basically I try to do a deal on this course like once or twice a year. So we'll probably do another deal on this at some point in 2023. So, uh, but yeah, we're taking $700 off of it for this flash sale here today. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy that when you get the course. Uh, basically, if you're brand new to the stock market, like start with the fundamentals of stock market investing section first, then worry about going through all these videos. If you're more experienced in the market, start exactly the way I have it laid out here. Watch that video first, and then just start going through all the course curriculum here. And for my more experienced folks, the area you're gonna get the most value, and it doesn't matter if you've been in the stock market for seven days or seven years, you'll get value from this course. This is a section that if you're a little more experienced, you're gonna get a tremendous amount of value from this area here, exactly how I value growth. There's a lot of things I talk about in here that I'd never talk about on YouTube. How I model revenue net income, how I value growth stocks, how I value stocks in general, how I research stocks step by step. Um, you know, This is a 24 minute video about around moat, which is very important, and also, I, every once in a while, I add new videos to this. So definitely, you know, come back to this course every three months, six months, something like that. Because like all these videos here for this bonus part have been added over the last couple of years, including this video I just added like a week or two ago here on comp. So definitely check that out, guys. Take advantage of it before it ends. Um, like I said, well, next time we do a deal on this course, it'll probably be you know, 2023 at some point, uh, I'm sure we'll do a deal, but yeah, it's going to be quite a while. So take advantage while we still got it and uh, enjoy that guys. Alrighty. So let's get into this little Fubo action. New and often misunderstood. <clears throat> we plan to clarify that today. Our industry is evolving quickly. We are in a massive market transition where consumers are opting out of expensive cable and satellite packages into more efficient. So cable. first off, let me just go back here Maybe and <clears throat> show you those kind of, of growth numbers. Fubo has been public for just 22 months. Uh, by the way, I got it at 2x speed, and the reason I have it at this because it's a long thing, and uh, I don't think we'll do the Q&A section because there wasn't a lot of value, and that will go all the way up to that. But, um, you know, basically this kind of shows their numbers over time, and it's been, you know, I, I would just say pretty darn impressive growth if you look at, you know, the kind of the two-year numbers here and where they're at with subscribers versus where they're at now, where they're at with revenue, and, um, you know, like, this is one of those rare companies that has growth literally as far as I can see. It's incredible. Still new and often misunderstood. We plan to clarify that today. Our industry is evolving quickly. We are in a massive market transition where consumers are opting out of expensive cable and satellite packages into more efficient pay TV, internet bundles. As the advertising industry follows the audience, traditional media dollars are chasing those digital consumers. And Fubo is moving even faster to capitalize on the moment at hand. Having reached the milestone of 1 million paid subscribers at the end of 2021, we see an opportunity to drive operating leverage in our business as we continue to achieve scale and advance against the total addressable market. What you're going to learn as this video goes along and we get more in depth here is Fubo has so many different ways they're going to be able to monetize over the coming years. Most people think about this if you just, you know, hadn't been really doing your research on this company. You think like, oh, they charge, let's say, $70 a month for their service or $80 a month or something like that, right? And that's the only way they can grow revenue when actually there's so many various ways that this company is going to grow their revenues over the coming years that uh, a lot of people don't even realize. So 65 million traditional cable and satellite households. So let's review the milestones we've achieved. Number one, business growth. We began as a soccer streaming platform seven years ago. Today, we're a full cable replacement service with coverage of more than 50,000 premium events across all sports. Number two, our proprietary technology. Supporting our expansive content offering is a scalable, highly automated technology infrastructure that's purpose-built, giving us a structural advantage to help drive subscriber acquisition, content strategy, and product decisions. Fubo's tech stack, proudly built in-house, means product innovation is at the core of everything we do. And we're focused on adding interactive features that turn passive viewers into active participants. Number three, acquisitions. M&A in the streaming, wagering, gaming, and computer vision sectors across the U.S., France, and India have enabled us to more quickly scale our platform, which we believe in turn allows us to drive business outcomes well ahead of the market. Number four, our geographic expansion. Fubo is the only virtual MVPD that is global. We now operate in the U.S., in Canada, in France, and in Spain. Today, we will give you a full picture of our strategy, including visibility into our product and technology momentum, our opportunity to massively expand our subscriber base, further expansion of our nascent Canadian and engaging Latino businesses, growth of our targeted advertising opportunity, the rollout of Fubo Sportsbook, and how all of these collectively are designed to drive us towards positive cash flow. We believe our thesis is more relevant today than it was when we went public two years ago. The traditional cable satellite model is under immense pressure. Consumers are switching from higher priced pay TV boxes to streaming TV. As I said earlier, there are still over an estimated 65 million people who subscribe to Dish or DirecTV, Comcast, Charter, Altice, and many others. We are 65 million, that's a, <clears throat> that's a huge number. And, you know, it just seems like as the years tick on, more and more people are going to switch from, you know, uh, let's call it those sorts of services to streaming over time. And if you're considering streaming, there's really two companies that are going to come to mind. One's YouTube TV and the other is Fubo. And Fubo's the, uh, let's just call it smaller company. But people look at this as like a David and Goliath. First off, there's so much market opportunity that YouTube TV is going to win and Fubo is going to win. But secondly, 
Um, don't count this company out because what I see them doing on the tech side, it's pretty amazing. And we'll get into that some of that in this uh, this uh, you know video here. Whereas YouTube TV, that's like like what is that for you for Google? You know, obviously that's owned by Google. It's like the tenth most important project they have going on. Where Fubo, this is all they focus on. So this is always something to, important to remember. Um, you know, if a, you are competing against a big dog company, it's like, how important is this thing to this big dog company? It's old, basic cable package by giving consumers diverse and expanding content. Anytime, anywhere access. Increased choice and flexibility and personalization and interactivity. All at an attractive price. We believe customers will continue to migrate from cable to streaming services, given the better experience, overall value proposition. We've already seen this disruption start to unfold. Entertainment was the first domino to fall. And entertainment viewership at top cable networks is falling as audiences migrate to streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Still, cable has remained the stronghold of sports. That's until now. We are seeing a real shift as sports audiences move from cable to streaming. With our growing portfolio of sports content aggregated into a single platform, Fubo aims to drive that disruption. You'll hear more today from the Fubo team about why we believe aggregation platforms are the gateway to television and the key to capturing consumer mind share. We believe Fubo sits at the intersection of three mega opportunities. These are And sports is, is so amazing for advertisers. And the reason being is, you know, if you a lot of people watch stuff on demand nowadays, right? So an advertiser, their commercials aren't even being seen or they're being fast forwarded through versus a sports event that's live and you're watching it in real time, right? People are actually getting to see the commercial. So it's it's literally still the holy grail for advertising. And what you're gonna learn as this video goes along is Fubo is gonna start making a lot of money from basically being able to do their own ad placements that they're making revenue on this different content. Okay, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Of cord cutting, shift of TV ad dollars to connected devices, and differentiation through interactivity. First cord cutting, the number of pay TV households has been decreasing as more subscribers cut the cord. So this is the numbers of pay TV. Households, um, you know, uh, kind of traditional cable here and kind of what's the expected uh, decline over the coming years. But the interesting thing is, like, it's still going to be a massive number. But the thing I think is important to understand about this is these folks are going to be switching to streaming platforms, okay? So this is a huge opportunity for a company like Fubo and, and also YouTube TV as well, right? Because this is 10 million plus people that are going to end up looking for services. And keep in mind, Fubo, as of right now, only has around, uh, you know, a, a million customers or so now also what i will say i think these numbers are probably low i'll be honest i think these numbers are probably low i think it's going to uh, i think the drop off is going to be more substantial over the coming years i think it's just people have been waiting to kind of get educated a little more on what are the other services and products that are that are out there you know things like fubo no one heard of, like a lot of people are still not aware of fubo right but especially if you go back two or three years ago no one ever heard of this right youtube tv is really just taken off in the last couple of years so these things are actually super new in the market as they get more and more known and more and more people you know, sign up for these services, they're going to tell friends and family about it as well. Oh, this is our service. This is how much we pay because people talk about this sort of stuff. And especially if people pay crazy amounts of money to the cable companies and satellite companies. So they'll talk about this. And also the beautiful thing with this business model, it's the, it's the right business model for this day and age where people want to be able to cancel a subscription if they want to cancel a subscription, right? And not have to lock in for, you know, two years or four years or whatever, you know, these traditional companies have kind of done. So I think that's kind of, um, you know, just one of many growth factors for the company. 68.5 million pay TV households at the end of 2022. We believe that while it is likely that traditional pay TV will continue to post high single digit year over year declines, Fubo will grow at a 20% plus compounded annual growth rate over the next few years. Yeah, 20% 20 is very low, in my opinion, for what they're actually going to put up. I think they're, they want to be safe with their numbers and their projections and things like that, which I think is a smart idea. You know, it's much better to, uh, you know, let's just call it under promise and over deliver than the vice versa situation. But, you know, I think, uh, I think likely 30% plus is realistic, in my opinion. That's just my opinion, okay? Consumers are favoring services like Fubo over legacy cable due to a robust content portfolio and a differentiated, personalized user experience, all at exceptional value. Secondly, advertising. Ad dollars are shifting towards connected devices away from traditional cable and satellite. For context, 46% of global impressions are on connected TV, yet only 22% of ad budgets are spent on CTV. But brands advertising on digital platforms still require high quality audiences, measurement capability, and first party data for superior targeting, all of which Fubo offers. Fubo's differentiated sports focus also gives advertisers the opportunity to target consumers when they are most engaged, emotionally and psychologically focused on their favorite teams. We continue to invest in our ad sales team, technology, and infrastructure to capitalize on this trend. And last but not least, interactivity. As the streaming industry becomes more competitive, companies want more attention and hours from consumers. Media and technology companies have adopted different strategies to expand offerings beyond streaming. Hardware control, Roku, devices and ecosystem, Amazon, mobile gaming, Netflix, etc. At Fubo, we're betting on interactivity, literally. 
Our subscribers in the aggregate stream an average of 100 million hours of content a month. And we are actively working to grow engagement even further by enabling our users to interact with their favorite content. Fubo's proprietary interactive features are integrated into the live TV streaming platform, enhancing the user's experience, creating a flywheel engagement effect, and differentiating us from our competition. Our CPO, Mike Berkeley, will take you through our interactive experiences shortly. Our goal with these products is to offer consumers... So what they got up there right there uh, is pretty interesting. I showed this on my Instagram yesterday. Um, but essentially, I, you know, I'm a big college football fan, so you know, college football season just started. And uh, it's amazing because I got an 85-inch TV in, in the living room, right? And I'm able to put up four games all at the same time in high definition on that TV through Fubo. And there's no other service I can do that on, essentially. And so that's a really cool experience. I just literally just put it on the, the Apple TV, on the Fubo app, and I can put up four games all at the same time, which is huge because as a sports fan, a lot of times there's multiple games going on at the same time. You want to watch same thing with baseball for baseball fans, same thing with basketball for basketball fans. And obviously football fans, like, you know, for instance, uh, I'll be able to, if for NFL, which I'm not as big of an NFL fan as college, but I'll be able to have red zone on plus the two games they traditionally have on. So I'll be able to have three screens all on the big TV at the same exact time, which is, uh, you know, for, for sports fans, that's huge for folks that maybe you aren't a diehard sports fan. You won't understand like how big of a thing this is, but for the, uh, let's just call it millions or tens of millions of diehard sports fans, this is a huge, huge deal. So, you know, same thing with soccer matches, anything where there's multiple games on at the same time. Traditionally, what you had to do is you had to keep flicking back and forth through the games. It's like, oh, this one just went to commercials. Now I flip back to this one and then I got to flip to the third channel and it's just a pain in the butt versus, you know, I, I tried this experience for the first time yesterday. It was like freaking amazing, man. Having four games up there all at the same time was so cool. A choice. With Fubo, they can enjoy a lean back or lean forward interactive experience. It's up to them. As many of you know, we always look for innovative, creative, and efficient ways to grow our reach and get in front of new audiences. So we are excited by our recently announced multi-year first look production partnership with Ryan Reynolds and his Maximum Effort Studio. Ryan needs no introduction, of course, but you may not know this. Ryan has been a major Hollywood star for over 30 years. His career box office receipts total billions of dollars. He has three movies on Netflix's top 10 most watched movies ever list, including Red Notice at number one. Ryan is a serial entrepreneur, deeply involved in companies across marketing, content, and advertising. He also owns a soccer club in the UK. We partnered with Ryan and his team to launch a maximum effort network on Fubo TV, with rights to distribute the channel to other platforms. We're working with Ryan to create content for the channel and plan to partner with brands to underwrite production. This deal aligns with our strategy of growing subscribers and expanding ad revenue. It also complements our original content strategy by adding premium entertainment content alongside sports. Ryan's goal for the channel is, in his words, to create joyful entertainment. Notably, Ryan and Maximum Effort are taking an equity stake in Fubo TV, demonstrating their confidence in our business. To sum it up, Ryan is one of the biggest stars in the world who can work with any media and entertainment company he chooses. He picked Fubo. We believe we are at an inflection point in the business given the size of our subscriber base and pace of innovation. Let me reiterate the key pillars of our growth strategy. Grow subscribers, monetize through subscription and advertising, optimize our content portfolio. All while advancing towards our long-term target of positive cash flow in 2025. Our objective for today is to provide a deep dive into each of those pillars. We'll present our long-term financial plan showcasing our path to sustainable revenue growth and margin expansion. You'll hear from our executive team on how each component of our business unfolds into the long-term plan. I will now turn it over to Mike Berkeley, our Chief Product Officer. Thank you, David. My name is Mike Berkeley, and I'm the Chief Product Officer. That means that my teams are responsible for all product and technology development at the company. Fubo's truly a tech-first media company. In fact, the tech team is more than half the headcount for the entire company. Today, I'm really excited to tell you about what we're doing, because really, no one else in the industry is doing what we're doing. <laughs> Imagine if everybody actually on the team actually spoke like this, and this wasn't at 2x speed. <laughs> It'd be like, holy smokes, how many dang Red Bulls these guys had? Some monsters, some rock stars. <laughs> I want to tell you how we're creating the most engaging way to watch live sports on TV. Fubo is the home for live sports. Unlike other TV platforms that are focused more broadly on entertainment, the vast majority of Fubo subscribers choose Fubo specifically for sports. In fact, 96% of our subscribers watch live sports every month. This is very attractive from a cost standpoint because we can spread the cost of our sports content across our entire subscriber base. With more sports channels than any other streaming service, we offer 50,000 live events each year. We have more soccer and college football channels than any other live TV streaming platform, and we have significant NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL coverage. As David mentioned, live sports has become very fragmented, and it's only getting harder for consumers. But it used to be easy. Not to date myself, but when I was growing up, there were only four or five channels that carried all sports events. There were no alternatives. And there was never any confusion about how or where to watch my favorite team. Well, fast forward to today. Live sports events are spread across many dozens of TV channels, dozens of different streaming apps, and across all kinds of devices. It's become so confusing for consumers to know which service to use to find the game that they want to watch. Yep. Fubo solves this. 100%. It's a modern product that brings back the simplicity of the old days. We offer a single location to get all leading sports. That's one app and one subscription. It's so much easier and ultimately less expensive for consumers. And that is the beauty of aggregation. As a result of aggregating all live TV together and our obsession with perfecting the product experience, we have incredible engagement on our platform. Our subscribers are glued to the TV. Our daily active users watch, on average, six hours a day. Think about that. Six hours a day. That's way more than Netflix. Zooming out to the big picture, overall, our subscribers stream 100 million hours of content each month. And that 100 million hours is just the average. In the big months, like last January at the peak of the football season, they streamed over 140 million hours of content. 
this captive audience. If you're a huge uh, college football fan, you're going to spend, you know, on a Saturday, you're going to spend 10 plus hours with your TV on. If you're a huge NFL fan, you're going to spend 10 plus hours with your, your uh, TV on more than likely because you got the morning games on, which each game is about three hours. Then you got the afternoon games on, which is about each game is about three hours. Then you got the night game on Sunday night football, right? If you're an NFL fan, which is another three hours. Plus, if you watch any pregame or some, some highlights afterward, like, you know, your, your TV is going to probably have been on 10 plus hours. Um, so that's why it's a, uh, you know, pretty darn powerful when it comes to sports and, and especially like football. Also watching on the largest screens in the house, over 94% of all viewing hours are on a connected TV. It's a large format, premium experience, and one that is also in high demand by advertisers seeking to reach a TV audience in a highly targeted manner. You'll hear more about how we offer this unique value proposition to our advertising partners later today. Unlike traditional cable TV, which is honestly a dumb hype, we have first-party data and insights into every consumer interaction and choice that they make on the platform. In fact, we collect over 2 billion data points every day, such as funnel entrances, engagement with interactive elements, video starts, pauses, rewinds, and, and much more. And really, that means three things. First, we can create a better, more personalized product experience. Second, we can anticipate what our viewers want to watch as soon as they turn on the TV. And third, we can offer insights to our advertising partners to help them better target their campaigns. We like to say that our subscribers come for the sports, but then stay for the entertainment. Not only is that true, it's really important. It allows us to minimize the impact of seasonality, which is a huge challenge for sports-only subscription services. Remember when I mentioned the 140 hours of content that we streamed in January? Well, most of that was actually entertainment and news, not sports. This allowed us to minimize the churn impact when the NFL season ended in February. Now, whether it's sports, entertainment, or news, another key point is that Fubo is mostly used as a live viewing experience. In fact, over 90% of all viewing hours on Fubo is live. This means that we have a high volume of people all watching the same event unfold at the same time. It's huge. There's a sense of shared experience and community on Fubo that just doesn't exist with on-demand services like Netflix or Disney+. Plus. This allows us to tap into real-time community engagement, like voting and making predictions about what's going to happen next in the game. These are fun experiences that can only happen with live TV. And of course, live audiences on the largest screen in the house watching premium content are the most coveted audiences for advertisers. So, let's talk about the platform. As a technology-first media company, we've built a proprietary platform. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because we aren't relying on vendors for our core technology like so many media companies do. We control our own destiny. We can build as fast as we want to. And it also means that we have features that no one else has. Remember those live, highly engaged viewers? Well, my team's obsession is creating products that are interactive, tapping into the passion of those viewers, and even giving them a way to put their own skin in the game. We're taking a passive experience and we're making it active. So let's take a closer look at some of these features. I'm going to walk you through five quick feature demos. The first is content discovery. The second is multi-view. The third is fan view. The fourth is free-to-play contests. And then the fifth is our integrated sports menu. As I mentioned, Fubo aggregates 50,000 live events each year. The job of the product is to make it super easy for viewers to navigate through it all and find exactly what they're looking for, and also to discover new content that they're going to fall in love with. There are a few ways that we do this. On the homepage, you have quick access to your favorite channels and shows, as well as to personalized recommendations based on your viewing preferences. And more times than not, you'll quickly find what you want on this first screen when you first launch the app. But you can also go deeper and browse event schedules by specific sport and league. On the sports page, you can see the huge diversity of sports that we have on the platform, and then you can drill down to see the schedules for each league we carry. And then in the guide, you can filter down hundreds of channels to just the sports channels that you care about. These tools make it super easy for sports fans to find the specific games that they're looking for. For many sports fans, especially on college football Saturdays, there are multiple games on at the same time that they want to watch. But bouncing back and forth between channels has always been a bit cumbersome with traditional cable TV. Fubo solves this with a feature called Multiview. It allows you to select up to four different channels to watch at once, all on the same screen. So yeah, you can watch two games at once, you can watch three games at once, or you can put four games on all at the same time. One of our most popular- And then I was really thinking crazy, I was like, imagine if I had an 85 inch TV above that one, then I could have eight games on at once. Oh my gosh, now that might be a little too much. But traditionally, if you wanted to have that sort of experience, you would need to get four separate TVs and you need to have four boxes to get that sort of experience. And so to be able to do it all on one TV is uh, pretty darn awesome. Unique features. And you can only get this on Fubo. No other streaming platform has it. Again, this is super helpful on Saturdays and Sundays during the football season, or even during tournaments with lots of events happening at the same time, like the World Cup or the Olympics. And earlier this year, we updated Multiview to add even more value. Now you can add live stats to this. And you know who this is also? There's many, many millions of people that love to bet on sports, okay? And so it's not just about the diehard fans like myself that, you know, love to watch uh, college football, let's say, on a Saturday. But it's about how many sports fans love to bet on sports, okay? And so if you are a sports better, right, which there's a lot of them, you know, of something like this feature here is absolutely massive. The fact that you can watch two, three, four games, because if you've ever known people that do sports betting, usually they have multiple bets on multiple games at the same exact time. So they're going to want to watch several games at the same time. So that's why a future feature like this is so awesome. Okay. Also think about all the fantasy football people, right? That want to watch uh, several different, you know, if they're playing fantasy football, Football, or if they're playing fantasy baseball or any types of like fantasy sports, they want to. They probably got several players playing in several games at the same exact time. They want to be able to watch all of those at the same time, right? So this is just something impactful. So you can watch multiple games, and you can see how individual players are performing. 
By the way, it's been really fun watching how our subscribers creatively use multi-view, even outside of sports. For instance, during elections or breaking news events, our viewers bring up multiple live news channels on the screen at once so they can bounce back and forth to make sure they're getting all angles of the story. There really are no limitations to multi-view. You can even watch uh, a live game, you can watch news, and you can watch a movie all simultaneously on the same screen. Our goal is to create the most ridiculous. engaging live sports experience in the world. The more our viewers interact and engage, the more they watch, and the more that they watch, the more that they lean in and interact. So we created FanView for viewers who want to lean forward and engage with what they're watching. In FanView, you can track live stats and engage with free-to-play games all while you're watching. You can also get quick access to the scores of all the other sporting events that are also happening at that moment. But honestly, these are just the tip of the iceberg for what's possible in FanView. As part of our product roadmap, we want FanView to provide a lot more value. We want to add live betting odds and integrate with the Fubo Sportsbook app so that you can track your wagers on the screen next to the game that you're watching. Eventually, we also want to add the ability to buy merchandise like jerseys and order food like pizza within FanView straight from your TV. And of course, all of this creates engagement that can be monetized with ads and sponsorships. Now, probably since the beginning of civilization, humans have competed in sport in front of live audiences. And along with that, audiences have been making predictions and bets on who's going to win in those competitions. Fubo is bringing this innate human behavior to the modern TV experience. We've done this first with free-to-play contests, where you can predict what's going to happen next in the live game, and then you can even win cash for getting the most predictions correct. So far, we found that... Think imagine this. Imagine this for a moment, okay? You are, uh, you know, I don't know, watching football or whatever, and then a little thing comes up on the sidebar and it says, like, you know... Order, uh, you know, Pizza Hut, extra large pizza, you know, for seventeen ninety nine right now or whatever, right? Um, and you could order right through there. Imagine how much like Pizza Hut or Papa John's or Domino's or whoever would pay for something like that, right? That it's like a little blast that goes out to everybody or it's like on a side menu or something like that, right? Like there's so many different ways when you have that sort of attention that ways you can you can monetize potentially here, um, you know, your service. So th that's where I kind of get into this whole like levers of growth. And like, it's one thing how they're going to grow subscribers over the coming years, right? And never mind if they go up on price over time, which they could easily because of the difference between their price and like what competitors usually charge in, in the space, right? But then it's the add-ons. Then on top of the add-ons, it's ad space they're going to be able to sell that we still got to get into here, right? Then it's potentially wagering on games straight through the straight, you know, straight through the service that they could get commissions on by leveraging um, basically like third parties and things like that. Then it's also like potentially you know straight advertisements to like order a pizza or order something on Uber Eats or something like that, right? DoorDash. Like, think about it. These companies would probably pay, a, let's just call it a, 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 a fair amount of money to, to have things like that, right? And, you know, those are deals that Fubo could, could do that are millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars for one of those deals. Um, so you really start adding up these numbers and it's like, holy smokes, man, they can have, they're going to be able to have so much growth from so many different areas of their business. Engage, they end up watching longer, which creates even more advertising inventory for us to sell. So let's check out a quick demo of our free-to-play games. Available to you on your TV while you're watching. Free to play is really fun and engaging, but we want to go even further. We want to enable viewers to truly put their own skin in the game. We've rolled out the Fubo Sportsbook app across multiple states, including New Jersey, where we soft launched yesterday. With our sportsbook, we're providing real money betting opportunities integrated directly into the TV viewing experience. And we're the only ones doing this. Let's check it out. <laughs> Kind of integrated TV and betting experience just doesn't exist on any other platform. When you're using the Fubo Sportsbook app, it will automatically detect what you're watching on TV and display bets in the app related to that game. And when you change the channel to a different game on TV, the Sportsbook app will automatically update with bets for the new game. It's really magical. We believe only Fubo can do this because our TV and Sportsbook products share a common backend and data platform. These valuable TV integrations are also something that we could potentially sell to other Sportsbook operators in states where we don't yet have market access. And this allows us to generate revenue from our own Sportsbook, but also from partner Sportsbooks. In addition to all of the product innovation that I just walked through, I also want to highlight my team's intense focus on our path to profitability. The technology team plays a big role in this, driving many of our advertising and growth initiatives. For advertising, we are hyper-focused on making our technology perform better. Now, backing up for a second, as a TV distributor, we're allowed to sell two minutes of TV commercials for every hour across all of the cable networks that we carry. And on our free fast channels... Two minutes for every hour, um, basically, of, of ads uh, they can do, which they can generate the revenue on that. All of the ad breaks, and then do a revenue share with our content partners. The role of advertising technology is to make sure that we're filling as much of the ad breaks as possible with the highest price ads available. The tech is dynamic. It can choose which ads to show in order to maximize the amount of revenue that we generate in each ad break. We believe we have a lot of room to improve how this technology performs, and we should see significant increase in our ad revenue per user in the second half of the year. In a few minutes, David's going to walk you through our ad business in more depth. 
on subscriber growth. Over the last few months, the tech team has been working really, really closely with the marketing team on critical initiatives to increase our margin. These include, first, selling higher price plans in our sign-up funnels. Second, selling more add-ons during the sign-up process, like adding a Showtime subscription. And then third, selling add-ons directly in the product experience at the exact moment when the user shows an intent to buy additional content. So I'm talking about a lot of specific tactics here, but we believe ultimately what's most important to profitable growth is long-term retention of our customers. And as we continue to improve the quality of the product experience, we expect to not only delight our customers, but to also see their retention increase over time. I also want to touch on a few really important cost-saving measures uh, within the tech organization. With the acquisitions that we made at the end of last year, we now have high-caliber technology teams across the U.S., France, and India. We also have access to the large and highly talented engineering market in India. In fact, we expect India will be where we grow the technology team for the next three years. This is smart growth. First off, like in the U.S., India has really smart and innovative engineers. Secondly, we believe it will save us $75 million over three years while we also increase our pace of innovation. It's also important to note that we're now developing the Fugo product around the clock and around the world. It's literally continuous development 24-7. With our acquisition of Molotov in France, we acquired the leading video streaming platform in France. And since the acquisition, we've been developing a unified platform to combine the best elements from Fugo and the best elements from Molotov into a single product. Just like Netflix and Spotify, we're designing a single app and a single back-end platform that can work anywhere in the world. In the short term, it means that every Fubo team across the globe will be building and innovating on the same platform, eliminating redundant work. This will unify the Fubo product and the Molotov product. They will become the same app. This new platform is also expected to give us new capabilities, like the potential to add a free tier to Fubo in the US, and new pay-per-view options for monetizing our content. And because it's being built as a flexible platform, we believe we'll be able to expand into new markets across the globe much faster when the time is right for the business. Okay, I just took you through a lot. Let me summarize. Our product and tech platform is unlike anything else on the market. It is a key asset driving Fubo's business forward. The incredible user engagement that we have, now remember, six hours a day, is also unmatched. That engagement is driving all aspects of our business. It drives our subscription business. It drives our advertising business. And now it's driving our sports betting business. It's really the foundation of Fubo. And with our new global tech team spanning three continents, we believe we can slash our costs while continuing to innovate. We expect all of this together accelerates our path to profitability. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Alberto. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and from my perspective, this company should just continue to focus on the U.S. and Europe. In my personal opinion, um, you know, that's where people obviously have the money to pay for these sorts of services, not to say they don't other places, but that's just where um, obviously the big money's at. And, you know, if we're talking about things like wagering on games and things like that, you know, the, the higher income, the more likely, uh, you know, let's just put it this way, the more likely those people are going to spend, right? Which I think is very, very important for the um, average revenue per user. Hi, my name is Alberto Duela. I'm co-founder and chief growth officer of Fubo TV, and it's a pleasure to be here. Today, I'd like to discuss our acquisition and retention efforts, especially in relation to our path to profitability. I'm also going to tell you about some key initiatives designed to improve our unit economics. I think we have a solid plan, and I'm excited to tell you about it. So let's kick it off. So first, on subscriber acquisition strategy. As you know, we are in a unique time in the history of television. There are over 65 million households still on traditional pay TV. Of those, nearly 9 million are expected to cut cable in the next few years. Companies like Fubo are set to benefit from that shifting consumption. And we believe that an aggregated streaming service remains the best value for core cutters. And that's because narrow services provide an incomplete offer, especially when it comes to key programming like football. Here again, our strategy is simple. It is to provide a well-rounded live sports and TV offer at a fair price to consumer. And so far, our strategy is working. Not only have we grown our base year over year, but the cost to acquire customers has remained efficient relative to our average revenue per user. We believe our marketing strategy allows us to efficiently target and capture the demand for cord cutters. Now, let me tell you more about how we acquire customers. By the way, if we're going to go really short term on Fubo too, um, obviously long term, this opportunity is just ridiculous. But short term, this company's got a couple things going to be working for it all at the same time. World Cup's coming up. That's going to be big for them. Um, also, another thing that's big is uh, college season just started for football, and then NFL season starts uh, this upcoming week as well, which is a huge kind of growth driver. And don't be surprised if Google Trends continues to, let's just call it, um, go up for Fubo compared to where it was at, you know, a few months ago or something like that. So, um, yeah, definitely. But obviously, you know, as far as my interest in this company is over, you know, the next five, ten years here. Team uses over 20 different acquisition channels, and no one channel accounts for the bulk of our growth. We are constantly optimizing this effort, introducing new channels and tactics always to maximize some return on ad spend. We do this by looking beyond acquisition cost, keeping a close eye on our customer behavior after they sign up. And let me give you an example. Having streamed the World Cup twice already, once in 2014 and again in 2018, we will use this past data to predict customer quality this time around. Specifically, we'll look at past conversion rates, engagement, which has an impact on our ARPU, and past retention after the event. This data gives us incredible insight into how our customers engage and how to optimize our marketing spend year after year. And the result is that we have derived growth while reducing our marketing spend as a percentage of revenue. It really is remarkable. Since 2018, we have reduced our sales and marketing spend as a percentage of revenue by two-thirds. This is great operating. That, yeah, that, that's, that's big, what you just saw right there. Um, you know, this is, this is big. And, and if this continues, this trend, you know, you're, a very, very profitable cash flow beast business is going to emerge here, essentially. Okay. This is a trend we love to see. Like, you know, if they can get a little lower in 22 and then in, in let's say, 23, they get down to like... 17% or 16% or something like that. And, you know, that's something that's absolutely very, very impactful. And if you're talking about getting to great margins, great profitability, great cash flows, this is a uh, important chart if they can keep that going in the uh, right way. 
Since 2018, we have reduced our sales and marketing spend as a percentage of revenue by two-thirds. This is great operating leverage, and more importantly, we expect this trajectory to continue. Last thing on this front, over the last 12 months, we have seen meaningful share of customers coming to Fubo organically. That is to say that they're not attributed to any paid marketing. This is important because if we killed all marketing tomorrow, we would still expect to see meaningful growth status. I think this shows the power of word of mouth and the fact that our customers love our service. Needless to say, I'm very proud of our marketing team and the work that they've done. In fact, according to M Science, when looking at the percentage of net ads among our peers, we have continued to capture market share, nearly 40% of net ads in the last 12 months. This gives us confidence in our strategy and the value that we provide our customers. And speaking of value, in recent quarters, we have introduced some truly phenomenal bundles, Fubo Elite and Fubo Ultimate, which our customers love. Not only are these plans packed with value and extended channel lineup, live games in 4K, a best in class DVR that never expires, but they're also backed by strong unit economics. Customers that choose Elite and Ultimate are more engaged, more profitable, and retain better than customers in our entry level plans. And the best thing is that we now see about half of new customers taking these premium plans. This makes us very excited because we expect it to have a material positive impact in our passive profitability. And next, I want to pivot to our pricing strategy and resulting churn dynamics. But first, let me reiterate we believe the virtual DVD product presents a winning value proposition relative to cable. Even now, the average cable bill is about $130 per month. That is nearly 2x the entry price of Fubo. I think this explains some of the dynamics that we've seen around our customers' price elasticity. Most recently, we migrated our Fubo starter customers to the Fubo Pro plan, effectively making Fubo Pro our entry plan. Although this migration provided our customers with an extended DVR service, it did increase our prices from $64.99 to $69.99 per month. Now, when we price up customers, we try to keep a close eye on the churn baseline relative to the expected baseline. In all our recent price ups, we have seen a very modest one-time increase in churn, followed by a return to baseline. And indeed, our most recent migration saw even less than expected churn, which is a testament to the value of our product. Having changed prices now several times, I think we have a strong pulse in our customers' price elasticity. Now, that said, we aren't going to pull on this lever willy-nilly, but it's important to note that relative to the average cable subscription, Fubo continues to provide excellent value for sports fans and their families. And to make this last point even more plainly, you just have to look at our cohort of attention. Despite having raised prices now several times since 2018, which we think would have a detrimental impact to our attention, the amazing thing is that we've been retaining customers at better and better rates year over year. We love seeing results like these. They are a testament to our marketing team's ability to attract premium customers and our product team's ability to provide an exceptional user experience. You know, uh, obviously we've talked a lot about sports already here, um, but I think one of the other big reasons, you know, if I look at Fubo over the next five, 10 years, who's our main competitor? In my opinion, without a doubt, it's YouTube TV, okay? And if I look at those two kind of compared to each other, if I'm a big sports fan, I've got to go with Fubo over YouTube TV, especially once you look at the different channels you kind of get with Fubo and the different things like being able to watch, you know, four games at once and things like that. So I think from kind of that angle, I think it's just very important to kind of understand this, right? Not everybody's a huge uh, sports fan, but for those sports fans, this is very, very key. And if you're talking about something that differentiates yourself, it's going to be on the tech side, right? And then it's going to be things like, you know, specific channels you offer. The, the reason I ever first started uh, signing up for Fubo to use was because they have certain channels that YouTube TV just does not have, okay? And like I said, I, I don't want to hate on YouTube TV or something like that. It's just, like I said, for Google, it's it's like, you know, they, they want it to be a success, but it's like, this is not the most important thing for them, man. There's so many things that Google has going on that's way more important. For Fubo, this is everything. So they're 100% dedicated to this and making sure they're, they're you know, become as big as possible, right? It's just a totally kind of different, um, you know, perspective there and, and angle that these companies are going after. Now, beyond our pricing efforts, our growth team has done an incredible job pricing new customers to try premium items such as Showtime and Sports Plus. We now see 14% of new customers attending a premium item when signing up for Fubo. That is relative to only 5% during the same time last year. That's a 3x increase year over year. This is another great trajectory with material implications on our long-term profitability. Lastly, we've begun to roll out new ways for customers to append premium items to their subscription right from their TVs. Our first effort features premium programming available on Fubo, yet not included in the customer subscription. This effort launched just this quarter and is already showing promise. I look forward to telling you more in the coming quarters. To wrap it up, there are over 65 million households on legacy pay TV who have yet to discover the joy of live TV streaming. That makes us very excited about the market opportunity, not to mention our growth trajectory. And we believe we have a robust strategy to influence monetization, including continuing to drive efficient growth in customer quality, lowering our market spend relative to revenue, increasing the penetration of our premium items, elite and ultimate, improving the retention of new and current customers, and lastly, growing the take rate of add-ons at different stages in the customer journey. We have much to do, but I believe we have a clear strategy on how to deliver it and the right team to make it happen. Now, I'll pass it on to Henry to discuss our content strategy after a short break. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Young, and I'm the Chief Business Officer. Let me start by taking a step back and sharing my perspective on the generation shift that's taking place in the TV subscription business. The traditional bundle TV subscription business, up until a decade ago, worked pretty well. Legacy cable understood better than most that there is value in simplicity. That is, a singularly priced aggregated bundle experience offers terrific value to consumers. You can sign up, either for DirecTV or Xfinity, and receive all sorts of great content in one place for one price. It also worked well as a business, because for the most part, consumers really not having any options like they do today. But this terrific business proposition was challenged not only by competing means of entertainment, but by the actual value proposition of the bundle itself. As more and more channels were added, the cost of the TV bundle increased rather dramatically. And consumers started to ask if paying for the ever higher price services was really worth it. Then came live TV services like ours, Fubo TV, offering better user interface and product. And quite frankly, they made the traditional TV services feel rather antiquated. Hence, we are now in a situation where the traditional bundle TV business is in perpetual decline. However, one element that still helps the legacy cable is that the consumers are willing to pay for live content, primarily for sports. 
Sports are very different than other forms of genre in the media business. People watch it to follow their heroes and be witness to the events as they occur. The main thing that's keeping the legacy TV model from imploding under the weight of court cutting, quite frankly, is sports, whose live and immediate nature makes all other genres less valuable in today's largely undemand world. The original proposition of football TV was to be the destination to stream all things sports. And that original proposition still holds very much true today. Remember, approximately 96% of our customers watch sports. Folks, our strategy is pretty simple. Provide a single platform bundle experience with as much sports content as possible, add in interactive and engaging capabilities, and do all that in a very affordable way. We believe that by providing the best bundle live TV experience, focus on sports, we will give consumers a reason to stick around and continue to pay for a streaming service. However, non-sports content has significant value to us as well. It allows us to provide reasons for our customers to stick around and continue to use Google TV even after their favorite event is over, which allows us to make more money through advertising. Almost two-thirds of our customers come for the sports. However, sports hours account for less than one-third of total hours watched. This type of behavior reinforces our saying, come for the sports, stay for the entertainment. As we aim to be the place for all things sports, we believe having some exclusive, sp exclusive sports content can help to grow our subscriber base. But it really has to be done with proper rate of return in mind. In the U.S., even though we remain engaged in the market for exclusive rights, we believe that the most efficient way to aggregate sports content is through our major media partners. Our belief is that no single entity can control and be the place for exclusive sports content whose aggregate price tag now exceeds staggering $25 billion a year. It is just too expensive and economically unjustifiable. In fact, arguably the most desirable product, the NFL, is locked out for the next 10 years with all the major media companies. But in non-US markets, we see some opportunities for exclusive sports content that we think that can help jumpstart our business. We are now the exclusive home of the English Premier League in Canada, and the early results of subscriber signups are incredibly encouraging. Next, I'd like to discuss how we're fulfilling the non-sports content needs of our customers while improving our operating leverage. The rise of free ad supporting networks, also known as fast channels, has been a pretty exciting one for us. Fast channels give football replacement content at superior economic terms compared to traditional linear networks. Fast channels do not have any license fees and have better advertising splits compared to traditional cable networks. For us, the standard deal may have us selling all the advertising inventory and that splitting that revenue 50-50 to 75% in our favor. And this is a huge improvement compared to the standard cable inventory split of only 50-20% to 20 for us. Said another way, zero license fees plus better ad terms equal more operating leverage for football. Not only the economics of fast channels, much more favorable, a majority of Americans are watching them more than ever before. A recent research report shows that 60% of U.S. TV households now watch fast channels. The growth has been rather staggering and in a very short period of time. And I bet you there'll be much more growth to be had in the coming years. Since the beginning of the year, we've added over 40 fast channels, bringing the total to about 50 today, and our goal is to have about 100 by the end of the year. Looking at our progress over the past year, customers are watching 25% more fast channels on our platform than before. And that share is being mostly come, coming from traditional cable entertainment networks. These growing hours are also helping to drive our long-term goal of attaining 15 to $20 of ad art proof, which they will expand upon a bit later. So to recap, here's what we're doing in content. First, we're aggregating sports content in the most affordable manner. Second, we're being extremely selective in securing any direct sports license, license rights, especially in the you U.S. You hear what he just said there? You're talking about 15 and $20 of, um, of ARPU from ads. So that would mean, you know, 15 and $20 of basically ad revenue on a monthly basis uh, per average user, which is a huge boost if that was to play out like that. Because think about it, like, you know, right now, Fubo's average revenue per user is probably around $70-ish, roughly, right? So if you add another 15 to $20 on top just from the ads, <laughs> that's a huge, huge deal there. And lastly, we're complementing our sports and portfolio with content that is affordable or with fast channels. We firmly believe that no single piece of content is a must-have relative to its inherent value. And everything is relative to the overall cost of the package. And folks, for us, alternative options are always available in the marketplace. Now that we have covered our content strategy, let's talk about how we plan to improve our unit economics. In our business, scale really matters. We are now big enough that we have some options in the marketplace. We have deals in place where we don't have to distribute content to all of our subscribers, which allows us to lower unit cost, and that in turn brings the overall content cost down. We have shown willingness to get creative as well. For example, with one sports provider, we reduce the cost by 25% during the term. With another, the unit cost dropped by 50%. Additionally, we never had all major content providers on our platform at one time. And that was on purpose, not by chance. Yet we have driven subscriber growth over the past several years, often at a faster rate than our competitors. Importantly, we're now a meaningful partner to our content providers. We're now a top 10 distributor, and one of only a few that is still growing meaningfully. I mean, look at some of these subs. You know, obviously, Fubo just hit a million recently. Uh, but I mean, look at some of these numbers, 5 mil, 10 mil, 14 mil, 15 mil, 17 mil. So the good thing for Fubo is as they get more and more subscribers, they're going to get more and more negotiation power when they are going to negotiate with... Um, you know, all these different networks and things like that, because at the end of the day, like, you know, the more powerful you are, the more negotiation leverage you have, you know, it's no different than the reason uh, Walmart can get a better deal than pretty much any other store on uh, paper towels or whatever it is, is because they're so big, they have that sort of uh, negotiation leverage. So that's just something to keep in mind when the smaller you are, the more you kind of, ah, unfortunately, kind of get screwed over a little bit because you don't have much negotiation leverage, right? You're the, the small guy on the block. You know, if you have 10 million subscribers, totally different situation. So that's just something to keep in mind there. We now have a better negotiating position with our content owners because of our current scale, growth trajectory, and the overall decline of cable and satellite providers. This allows us to grow our partner's distribution and advertising revenue. And since there are no new distributors that can write eight to nine figure checks, we're not that easily replaceable by them. 
We also have executed new deals that are non-variable in nature, and this allows us to outgrow carriage costs, making the channels become margin positive for advertising dollars. And I'll be remiss if I did not mention add-ons. Every one of our add-on packages is margin positive. Add-ons allows us to provide options to customers without forcing them to pay for things they don't want to watch. And no surprise, they love it. So let me share some numbers with you. We retain customers with add-ons 28% longer, and they watch Fubo 32% more. We've grown add-ons per subscriber over 500% over the past three years. And finally, and subscribers now average over three add-ons. And add-ons can be bundled with service-level upgrades like DVR storage or additional streams, and this creates obviously higher price packages. And just like Mike told you, we have more data than anyone else. We have the ability to track and measure viewerships, viewership levels all the way down to a program level. So we can be confident when we make decisions about adding, or repackaging, or removing content. Putting the right content in front of the right people allows us to generate most upselling opportunities, which helps to produce profitable, long-term customers. So let me summarize here. First, we plan to continue to expand our content offering by introducing fast channels, giving us more money to spend on networks, networks with sports. Second, we're extremely focused on controlling our unit. I just looked up YouTube TV. YouTube TV is already over 5 million subscribers, which just goes to show you, you know, how big these these two platforms are going to become, in my opinion. Obviously, Fubo's uh, behind them. They, they don't have the, you know, as big of a brand name. They're more uh, of an unknown coming in the space versus YouTube TV. But it just goes to show you, like, uh, you know, if you add up between the two, it's over over 6 million already. And, you know, YouTube TV, in a snap of fingers, is going to be over 10 million. And Fubo TV, very quick is going to be, you know, two, three, four million. So just something to keep in mind there. And total cost, and we continue to scale. As we, as we continue to scale, we expect that our deals become more favorable and we will continue to bend the cost curve down. And third, we're focused on driving upsells both in add-ons and higher-priced bundles, which improves and expands our margins. Our strategy is to be the streaming service of choice for sports fans. And that means the most sports content at the most affordable price. Thank you for your time today, and I will hand it back over to David. Hello, everyone. I'm back to take you through our advertising strategy and how we are positioned to capture this massive opportunity. But before I do... And in case you missed it yesterday, we have announced Lynette Kaler as our new SVP ad sales. I'm very excited to welcome Lynette to Fubo. Lynette has deep experience in the programmatic ad space, where she led M1 partnerships. Lynette's mandate is to expand key advertiser relationships, increase Fubo's direct and programmatic ad business, and more effectively monetize our CTV ad inventory. We expect big things from Lynette, who officially joins Fubo on Monday. Now, let's dive into Fubo's ad opportunity. As I said in my opening comments, 50% of consumers' time is spent streaming TV, yet only 22% of traditional ad budgets are spent on connected devices. More recently, however, Eyeballs are shifting to CTV, and dollars have continued to follow. This trend represents a very exciting opportunity for us. We believe as traditional linear TV continues to decline, we are uniquely positioned to capture a growing share of television ad dollars. Let me first tell you about our high-quality, engaged audience, and premium programming. Based on our data, we believe our subscriber base skews significantly younger and more affluent. More All right, so let's look at these numbers here. Um, obviously, much younger age. Um, and obviously, you know, something important to just remember is, <laughs> like... Think about this for a moment, right? And this is this one so once again goes back to long term opportunity. Think about the kids that are in high school right now. Think about the kids that are in college right now, right? When these folks, uh, you know, go and get their own apartments or their own homes, things like that, and they're looking to sign up for a service, who do you think they're going to sign up with? An uh, old school cable company or something like a Fubo or YouTube TV? Obviously, it's going to be something like a Fubo or YouTube TV, right? If they're a huge sports fan, then they're going to sign up with something like a Fubo. So it's just important to remember this next generation and what they're going to be signing up for, right? So uh, average age, really young compared to the traditional. Average income, much more substantial than, uh, you know, let's just call it the rest of them. And uh, obviously, subgrowth is you can't even compare them. So, yeah, th those are very favorable, favorable numbers in metrics there. And more tech savvy than traditional cable and satellite audiences. Advertisers are willing to pay a premium to get in front of our unique audience, which cannot be reached on linear TV or through other virtual MVPDs. In a nutshell, we deliver a highly targeted, unduplicated audience within a premium, contextually relevant environment. In addition, 94% of viewing hours are consumed on CTV, and over 90% of content is viewed live. This means that our audience can be reached with contextually relevant and timely marketing messages in the most premium viewing experience available. In addition, our programming has unique breadth and depth, as we offer over 50,000 live sporting events per year, and we are the only live TV streaming platform with every Nielsen-rated sports channel. This means they're literally in the holy grail of everything. If you're an advertiser, it's, it's amazing. So, yeah. It's a completely brand safe environment. Now, I'll turn to our tech capabilities. We have a proprietary technology stack designed to enable both an exceptional user experience and a premier advertising opportunity. We've attracted blue chip advertisers who are willing to pay a premium for measurement, addressability, and targeting. First, we leverage first party subscriber data to create custom audience segments. As Mike Berkeley alluded to, we capture 2 billion data points per day, allowing us to serve marketing messages to users at the most opportune moments. We partnered with leading data enablement platforms in order to deepen our household targeting efforts on an ongoing basis. Additionally, since it's an election year, we are prepared to light up the kind of micro-targeting with psychographics, demographics, and buyer behaviors that modern-day political campaigns seek. On the measurement and attribution side, Fubo measures the results of addressable campaigns and leverages data partners for third-party attribution studies. 
We allow advertisers to measure ROI in an environment where companies are increasingly viewing advertising dollars as an investment versus an expense. We also enable innovative branding and engagement opportunities, which complement our focus on interactivity. As noted earlier, interactivity is the cornerstone of our product roadmap. We can monetize FTP, FanView, Pickums, and any elements of the product or video experience. Our unique positioning has resulted in rapid ad revenue growth of over 150% over the past few years. Look at those numbers. And <laughs> the, the great thing about ad revenue, like, that's only going to continue to go up massively over the coming years. And I mean, their ad revenue business alone is going to start generating several hundred million dollars a year. And then eventually they'll cross the billion dollar mark in ad revenue. Like this is just a baby business. They're just starting to get up and rolling. Um, you know, th this year it, it will be, the, in my opinion, it's the first real year of their ad revenue business this year in 22. And then things are just going to continue to scale from there. And before you know it, it'll, they'll be bringing in 500 mil, 700 mil and a billion dollars of, ad, of just ad revenue alone. Most importantly, advertising is essentially 100% gross profit and accrues materially to EBITDA. We are targeting 15 to $20 in ad ARPU over the long term. 50. We are confident in our ability to meaningfully expand ad ARPU from our current levels, given that traditional cable and satellite companies are already in our targeted range. And yeah, I mean, look at how low they are when it comes to that right now, ad ARPU. You know, and they're talking about going to 15 to $20 over time. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a significant number. And, you know, many of their peers are obviously more in that, that range, let's just call it that. Even have our measurement and data capabilities. In short, we are just getting started. So how do we get there? We plan to expand CPMs from our current levels of low 20s to over $30, and that's through targeting and addressability. We plan to maximize fill rates while optimizing ad pods between 15 and 30 second ads. We are in the very early stages of this particular effort. We plan to continue to implement AI. The great thing is the 15 and $20, look at that. They had that for 2025. So the question is, where are they at in 2027, 2029? You know what I mean? Like, that's the way I think, because I'm usually thinking about, especially a business like this that has this big of an opportunity, I'm usually thinking about it more on a, a five to 10 year span. Like, usually how I think about a stock is like the next three to five years. This one, I'm thinking a little bit more because the upside potential is so huge. I'm thinking a little bit more on like a five to 10 year kind of play out here. Drive users towards content best optimized for monetization, including fast channels and cable networks and introduce new, unique ad formats, more monetizable, interactive elements. Collectively, these efforts are designed to extend the lifetime value of our subscribers, enhance our unit economics, and deliver value to both our customers and advertising partners. We are pleased with our progress to date, and we are excited about the investments we continue to make in our technology, our team, and infrastructure. We look forward to bringing a new dimension of value to our advertising partners as we scale and advance towards our long-term ad ARPU and profitability goals. I am now going to turn it over to Scott Butera, our president of gaming. Hi, I'm Scott Butera, president of Fubo Gaming. Fubo's strategy is based on the strong relationship of watching and wagering on sports. We are seeking to revolutionize the mobile sports betting industry by creating the first integrated watching and wagering platform. This creates great live viewing experiences for our customers and has many business advantages. Now, you may have seen we've recently announced that we're doing a strategic review of our wagering business, and we've decided we no longer want to pursue this business on our own. Now, why would we decide that? Building and running a national sports book requires significant capital. There are large startup costs and risk of occasional losses, which also requires capital. When we started Fubo Gaming, markets were flush with cash, and investors value growth over profitability. Today, the market is the opposite. Capital is expensive, and investors want to see profitability now. In light of this, we are strategically evaluating our gaming business, including... And I love this, okay? I would much rather have Fubo partner, partner with other, uh, let's call it established sports books and things like that, and Fubo brings the tech side and the platform in, right? I think that's ingenious. And then over time, right, as Fubo eventually gets to become a profitable company and a cash flow company, then they can start essentially maybe potentially going to these companies and wanting, let's call it just a better margin or something like that. Or then they can start pursuing, we're going to do our own sports book. And so all of a sudden it starts being swapped out of, they were using this sports book as uh, kind of the one that was doing the whole deal to then they're using their own, right? They can go that route over time, which is just another bigger opportunity. But in the short term, let's call it the next three to five years, I think it makes a lot of sense to just partner with folks that, that you know, are, are looking to get their name. Because there's a lot of companies that are already in kind of the sportsbook area online, but they have trouble getting customers. And they're having to spend a fortune on advertising to try to get customers over to try their app or their platform and things like that. Fubo already has this here, okay? So in my opinion, Genius. Like, don't go, don't go at it yourself. Use other companies, leverage those. And then over the years, once you get to a great place financially, then you can worry about let's do it all in house and let's make every single margin dollar possible down the road when, when it's appropriate. Partners who share our vision for the platform. However, we remain committed to our strategy of being the first true watch and wager platform. And now I will tell you why. Fubo subscribers are sports fans who have a strong demographic profile that matches the profile of a quality better. They have an average net worth of just under 900,000 and income of 88,000. 75% own a residence, and just under half have college degree. Look at that, you know. <laughs> like I said, like Fubo really got, has like literally the, uh, the creme de la creme. Like if you're an advertiser or you're just thinking about a business model, like, you know, 
they're in a pretty good spot when it comes to their subscriber base and the money they have and things like that. Most important, oh. approximately 60% are males who watch a ton of sports, the sweet spot of the sports betting demographic. These subscribers are very likely to bet on sports, which gives us a built-in customer base. Let's talk about sports fans when it comes to wagering. 80% of those who place bets are likely to watch sports. Now, why is this? Let's take CNBC. Most of you here today are investors in public companies. I'm certain you track your positions through media outlets like CNBC and Bloomberg. Well, betters want to do the same. Just as you want to know how a position is doing and potentially make adjustments, so does a better. Uh, uh, sir, I only actually watch Jeremy Lefebvre. He gives me all the information I need to know. I don't need to know anything else other than what he knows, okay? Do this. Well, just like the securities market, dynamic in-game betting allows for continuous wagering. The value of a bet actually adjusts during a game. This means a better can double down or cash out of a position or prop bet while also placing bets on upcoming events during the game he or she is watching. Through our integrated platform, a better is able to quickly place bets on what they are watching. Watching sports excites and engages fans, driving billions of dollars in sports-related transactions. Consider your last experience at a stadium or arena. Fans were not just sitting in their seats watching the game, but buying merchandise, consuming higher-end food and beverages, congregating in clubs, and now wagering. Other sports books have recognized this correlation, but to date have only placed betting content on media platforms. Only Fubo's platform allows a better to both watch and bet in one environment. Now we have a unique ability to acquire quality bettors. As stated, over 96% of Fubo subscribers watch live sports, giving us a built-in customer base. As mentioned, our subscribers stream over an average of 100 million hours of content a month. And last January, during football season, they streamed 140 million hours. We also offer 50,000 live sporting events a year. This gives us many opportunities to access potential bettors, a huge distinction and advantage over our rivals. Getting sports bettors isn't enough, though. You need the right ones. As a quick aside, I grew up in Gloucester, Mass., the fishing capital of the U.S. There, captains established their reputation by knowing where to catch big fish. Same with sports betting operators. Approximately 90% of sports betting revenues come from 10% of the betting population. 90% of sports betting revenues come from 10% of the betters. Important number to uh, keep in mind there, okay? By analyzing viewing patterns, particularly how much sports a viewer watches a day, we can identify the most valuable customers among Fubo subscribers. This allows us to prudently allocate marketing spend to these customers and avoid spray and pray marketing, such as expensive ad campaigns, sponsorships, and big free bet promotions that have attracted the wrong type of customer. To execute our strategy, we have many engagement features in our product plans. First, our odds integration, where sportsbook odds will pop up on the TV. This feature has several advantages. It allows us to teach newer bettors the vocabulary and strategy of betting as they are actually watching what is being described. It also provides functionality demanded by the most sophisticated bettors, like displays where they can track their bets. We can highly personalize the user experience by surfacing relevant bets. Because we know our customer, we can offer timely bets we believe they will like. For example, we can offer boosted odds. Or we can push a bet on an event that's about to take place. Imagine, it's the end of a football game and there's a last-minute field goal attempt you want to bet on. We can push that to you versus having to navigate multiple pages to find this bet on other platforms. Our metrics are outperforming competitors. For example, our subscriber population outperforms other sports books in terms of average bet size. We also have high penetration, meaning Fubo subscribers are placing more deposits on sports betting sites than do subscribers of other streaming services. Again, it gets back to that strong demographic we have. Our subscribers are very likely to bet, and the statistics are demonstrating that. As we've executed our strategy, we've also seen a significant decline in our customer acquisition costs, or CAC. In fact, the last eight months, our blended CAC has decreased by 72%. As we continue to convert viewers into bettors, we expect to see further reductions. We have also seen a steady repeat deposit rate of 72%, while our deposit size and bet size have grown by 10%. Fubo has made significant progress in developing our sports betting business. Sports betting licenses are limited by the number of licenses available in each state. A mobile operator must obtain a license from a casino operator, sports leagues, teams, racetracks, or by directly applying to the state. Fubo has successfully obtained market access agreements via all of these avenues in 10 states. We have successfully launched our mobile app in Iowa and Arizona and soft launched in New Jersey yesterday. We expect to launch an additional state in time for the upcoming football season. To maximize the value of our subscriber base, our growth strategy will be based on converting subscribers to bettors. We are also focusing on states where we have strong content providers. To summarize, the current sports betting market has 12 billion in revenues across 25 states with more to come soon. We believe our great product, significant market access, and the ability to officially tap into this makes teaming up with Fubo an attractive opportunity. This is evidenced by our early results in acquiring, retaining, and providing integrated viewing experiences to the most sought-after sports bettors. And with that, I will hand it off to our Chief Financial Officer, John Janidis. Hi, everyone. I'm John Janidis, CFO of Fubo. Thank you for joining us today. You've heard a lot from some of the members of our leadership team this afternoon. When I think Fubo, I think about a tech company in the media space. I say that because many of you see how hard it is for media companies to transform themselves into tech companies. Roughly half of our employee base resides under Mike's team. Engineers, producers, and designers. This is a testament. Half of the employee base is on the tech side. I think that's important, man. I think that's important. If you're thinking about Moat, um, if you're thinking about how they compete in the marketplace over not just right now, but over the coming years, I think that's very, very important that they, you know, they have this, you know, employee force that is so made up of tech workers. I think it's phenomenal. And technology first approach to transforming the consumer experience and capturing market share. Speaking of teams, the themes around the focus on profitability are consistent across all of them. I'm going to pull these things together and provide more detail on our business model and how we plan to get to profitability. We continue to work towards our long-term targets of adjusted EBITDA profitability and positive cash flow in 2025, and the FUBO flywheel will help us track towards that goal as we execute a plan of controlled growth alongside margin expansion. On the subscriber front, we expect to see growth of nearly 200,000 in the third quarter alone, ending the year with North America's subscriber growth of nearly 20% to more than 1.3 million subscribers. And we're also focusing on more profitable subscribers. 
We posted positive adjusted contribution margin in the second quarter, and we expect to see continued improvement in ACM going forward. How do we get there? We see the individual pieces as working together to achieve a significant goal, which is, yes, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, profitability. Here's our vision. Henry's content team will use data to drive decisions around our renewals in support of maintaining a portfolio of differentiated and compelling content with the greatest level of return. And here's a hint. Not all content is worth renewing. Alberto's team will continue to optimize around the most ROI-positive acquisition channels in order to drive stickier, more profitable subscribers to our platform, and they'll do it efficiently. Our ad sales team will leverage our sports-centric audience in order to drive high-margin ad revenue dollars on a per-subscriber basis. As many of you know, the sports ad market is resilient and tends to outperform the broader marketplace through an economic cycle. And this is on top of the shift of ad dollars from linear to CTV. Mike's team will help in the monetization and retention of those subscribers, and even more importantly, bring joy to the subscriber's experience through continued product and technology innovation. So take the right content, add the right subscribers, throw in hours spent on our tech platform, and you've got an incredibly engaged consumer. And then we monetize them through high-margin ad dollars. We're also focused on our cost structure. We've identified potential cost savings in the low to mid tens of millions of dollars on an annualized basis starting next year. Based on our expectation of the benefits of scale when negotiating outside of our content partners, we expect that number will move higher. We see further opportunities in media, software, technology, to name a few. And what we've done to date in North American streaming is pretty special. An independent, virtual, MVPD competing against tech conglomerates and entrenched incumbents. As Alberto explained, we've garnered approximately a 40% market share of the virtual MVPD subscribers over the past year. But let me dig in. You know, and they, they have that number there of, uh, you know, 2 million plus North American subscribers in, in 2025 estimated. <laughs> I think it's low, man. I think they're going to be at like, you know, and obviously they're, they're leaving themselves for upside there, 2 million plus, right? But I wouldn't be surprised at all if they're at 2.5 mil or even, dare I say, 3 million come 2025. I think, I think this transition is going to happen much more quickly. And I think the more success YouTube TV has and Fubo, the more it's going to push uh, both the platforms essentially bigger and bigger as more and more people that are either thinking about signing up for a service of some kind, right, are going to consider these or uh, the people that are switching, getting out of contracts and things like that. I think I think the bigger these things get, I think the more impactful they're going to be and the more and more you know, friends and family are going to tell each other. You know, picture you going over a friend's house or family member's house, right? They got four games on it once. You're like, how are you watching four games at once? And they're like, oh, this through this uh, service I signed up for a Fubo. You know what I mean? Like those sorts of things are just so dang impactful. And then they're like, how much is it? And they're like, oh, it's, you know, 70, 80 bucks a month. And the guy's like, what the heck? I pay, you know, 135 for my service. I can't even do anything close to that, right? And I'm locked in this contract that's ending in three months, you know? So, yeah. Deeper. Again, we expect to end this year with more than 1.3 million subscribers. We know we're in the sweet spot. We've got the secular tailwind of being a streaming TV cable replacement. And we plan to grow subscribers through marketing channels that are super efficient. We're highly focused on our subscriber acquisition cost and continue to expect a significant number of subscribers coming through organic or zero cost channels like word of mouth or reactivations. And we continue to feel confident that we can post positive adjusted EBITDA with well below 3 million subscribers. We also expect leverage on the adjusted contribution margin front as our subscriber base grows. Between our expected subscriber growth and other tactics, we forecast revenue to more than double between 2022 and 2025. And there's a multiplier on our subscribers to revenue of roughly 1.5 times. We also believe we have multiple paths to expand average revenue per user, or ARPU. And not just from increasing the price of our monthly subscription, we have other ways. We have a highly desirable customer, younger, higher income, engaged. Our subscribers are nearly 10 years younger than our peers, roughly 20 years younger than the typical broadcast viewer. And sports-focused subscribers, they tend to be less price sensitive. In our $5 price increase for the majority of our base in the second quarter, churn was below our expectations. But beyond price, we're seeing success with upsells, add-ons, and we feel good about the changes we're making for that to improve even further. To get a monthly ARPU of approximately $100 by 2025, we need to post growth in the high single-digit range annually, and we think that's achievable. On the ARPU side of our business, there are multiple paths to growth. We see upside coming from CPM growth, from increased fill rates, and investment in our team, including more sales resources. On the CPM side, marketers like our data and the ability to better target potential customers. In total, we think ARPU has the potential to double over the next few years. Now think about that. Simple math here. If we more than double monthly subscribers and double ARPU, we're going to potentially see triple-digit growth in ad revenue over the next three years. Potential growth in the four times range from current levels. For our rest of world streaming, predominantly our volatile business in France, the business is tracking ahead of our expectations this year after closing the transaction last December. We expect paying subscribers will nearly double this year, and the team continues to focus on the three C's, contribution margin, content costs, and cash flow. Contribution margin take positive at the end of the second quarter, and free cash flow is tracking roughly 10% better than planned as of the second quarter. We expect subscriber growth to slow in future periods, but remain north of 20% as we test new pricing models to accelerate the path to profitability. And we expect revenue growth will more than double over the next three years, allowing the global streaming business to post positive EBITDA. As you've heard earlier, we expect that our unified tech platform will also allow us to gain operating leverage in this business as revenue scales. Now look, I've talked a lot about revenue drivers, but I want to walk through our cost structure to talk about the operating leverage inherent in our model. Between 2018 and 2021, we've seen a significant amount of operating leverage in our four major cost buckets, G&A, tech and development, sales and marketing, and subscriber-related expense. All right, if you're still watching this video right now, um, 
and you're enjoying something like this, let me know in the comment section that you're enjoying a video like this because other companies do investor days. Um, I, I think this is the first time I've ever reacted to an investor day that a company's done. So let me know if you're enjoying something like this and I can do more of these sorts of videos in the future potentially on this channel of stocks that I'm very interested in. Just let me know, okay? I appreciate that. And, and also let me know if you're you're still watching the, the video right now because this is, this is the biggest video I've ever made on YouTube in terms of the length of it. This is an animal here. Operating expenses as a percentage of revenue. Over that time, improving by more than 100 percentage points. And we expect another 50 points of improvement from 2021 to 2025. As I've said, we've been reviewing our cost structure and we continue to find areas to operate more efficiently, ways to use our increasing scale to negotiate better deals with our vendors, including reopening contracts prior to scheduled renewals. We're also seeing increase around partnering in certain areas of our business, providing opportunities for us to increase engagement and drive subscriber or advertising growth without the need to increase headcount. Since I joined Fubo about six months ago, our content team has renewed distribution deals with several of our content partners and in aggregate, unit economics have improved. And since content deals tend to be multi-year in nature though, it takes time to start seeing the benefits. But we think these benefits will become more visible to investors and analysts as we bend the cost curve. Henry's team also uses a tremendous amount of data to help make decisions on content to either drive or retain our subscribers. That puts us in a good position when it comes to renewals or dropping content. Putting it all together, where does that lead us in terms of EBITDA and free cash flow? On the revenue side of Fubo, we see it more than doubling over the next three years. And our unit economics improve as we execute on that plan. Through the first half of this year, our cash flow usage was 210 million, and we expect 2022 will be our peak cash burn. So where does that leave us in terms of our balance sheet and runway? As a reminder, we announced earlier this month that we are putting our wagering business under strategic review. Given the range of outcomes, I want to isolate our cash needs, excluding gaming for modeling purposes. Based on our cash balance as of the end of Q2 and our current operating assumptions, we believe the cash needs to get our core streaming business to free cash flow positive or self-funding or modest. How do we define that? Less than $100 million. As you can see in the chart, we expect to be there in 2025. When we ultimately decide to raise capital, we expect to maintain optionality and we use the most efficient means possible. Our options could range from raising equity or debt like we have in the past, or among others, we could also be more strategic. While we look for opportunities to reduce costs, I also tell our leadership that we need to invest in areas that have high returns and will drive growth. We have no debt maturities until 2026. Opportunities, though, may present themselves to optimize our balance sheet, and we will review those over time. But we are committed. Now, what, what could impact this company in a way that potentially you never have to do a raise of any kind um, or take out any debt? I think the thing that could potentially um, get them to that place, if this was to happen, which we'll see, is if they grew subscriber count and ARPU at a much more substantial rate than what they are thinking they're going to grow. Right now, I feel like their numbers are very conservative. If they grow faster, uh, they can get to cash flow positive faster than maybe they expected and profitability as well as far as the, the bottom line there, okay? And also the, the ad business. If the ad business scales faster than kind of what they're anticipating, that would be another situation where, you know, they're, they're in a, let's just call it a sweet spot. The other potential is if they lock in some gaming deals with um, some companies and maybe potentially get some upfront money as part of the deal or something like that and then get some sort of commission on the backside and if that scales faster as well so those are just ways that the company could get to let's just call it cash flow positive and become a um, let's just call it a uh, even a profitable company maybe faster than they're anticipating that's what would need to happen being good stewards of capital we made several acquisitions in 2021 we will continue to focus on integration this year molotov and edison ai in particular while based outside the u.s benefit us across platforms and between our businesses in North America, including Canada, as well as France and Spain, we are becoming increasingly efficient. With Molotov specifically, we are sharing engineering resources, and we are also going to market in a global, unified fashion. One of the expected benefits is extracting better terms from suppliers. With the ongoing macro uncertainty, our focus this year is going to be squarely internal. We're planning to invest in ourselves, and we believe the growth opportunities that we can capitalize on are significant, as we've shown you today. Finally, we announced one of those growth opportunities last week. As David mentioned earlier, we announced that we entered into a first-look deal for unscripted content with Maximum Effort Productions, a production company co-founded by Ryan Reynolds. Yes, the Ryan Reynolds whose movies have grossed billions at the global box office. Together, we expect to launch the Maximum Effort Network on Fubo TV next year. From a funding perspective, we'll be reallocating a portion of our programming budget from the Fubo Sports Network. And when appropriate, look to co-finance production. Sponsors have already expressed interest. By the way, our outlook does not assume any benefits to our subscriber base from this partnership. And Ryan and the team have chosen to take compensation in the form of equity, some of which won't be issued unless Fubo stock trades above $30 for a period of time. That's a big vote of confidence in our ability to jointly create shareholder value. So the stock price has to be over $30 for a period of time in order, uh, you know, for him to be able to exercise those options. And that's just, uh, yeah, that's big. That's big. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would love a $30 share price on this stock. We thank you for your time today. And with that, we look forward to your questions after a short break. Welcome back. Uh, I have with me on stage the Fubo Leadership. All right, so that's where I'm going to wrap this baby up. If you guys want to watch the Q&A section, you obviously can. It's on uh, Fubo's IR uh, page. It's also on this uh, page as well. You can literally just type in Fubo TV Investor Day, and it will pop up for you if you're more interested and want to watch the Q&A section. Uh, but that's about it for me, guys. This was a beast video. This is literally, I think, the longest video I've ever done on YouTube. I don't know. Maybe I'll even post this on the main channel. I don't know. Usually I post reactions always on the uh, my new channel, Jeremy LeFay Makes Money, the 
reaction channel, but uh, I don't know, maybe I'll pose this on my big dog because this is intense. So anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed this. As always, to become a master of stock market sale is going on as we speak right now. And uh, you know, if you're watching this a couple days from now, it'll already be long over. So if you wanna take advantage of that before that flash sale ends, check out pinned comment down there. Much love as always and have a great day.